All right, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the South Carolina Ag Disruptors webinar. I'm Kevin Burkett with the Clemson Extension Agribusiness team. And this is a running series that we've had since earlier this year where we do a, a monthly topic and a couple speakers each month to touch on items and uh, programs and things that could have a significant impact on agriculture in South Carolina and could have a significant impact on the uh, producers of South Carolina. So each month we have a little bit different speakers, a little bit different topics. Sometimes it's um, livestock, sometimes it's row crops, sometimes it's more of a horticulture focus. But again, uh, we try to have a wide variety of things and a wide variety of topics and speakers. So. We appreciate you uh, joining us for today. We'll have a slight modification to the schedule. Zach Snipes that was supposed to speak had something come up uh, today and will not be able to join us. So we might have a informational video about the Farming Foundations course that we can share a little bit later. And we'll probably try to have Zach on at a later webinar as well. But uh, so with that, um, we will just have Dave Lemie speak for us today and talk about the Southern Heritage Crops Project. So um, in just a moment, I'll turn turn it over to Dave. But um, as you even come across topics or speakers and things that you feel like you would like to learn more about, you can submit questions to us, you can submit speakers or topic suggestions, and we will work towards having that uh, in an upcoming webinar. So we've got one more scheduled for this year. We have December where we'll have Steve Isaacs from University of Kentucky talk about employee retention and management as labor is certainly a, a hot topic and has been a hot topic for a while. So wanted to touch on that. And then we will very likely restart the series in 2023. We have not set the schedule for that yet, um, but be on the lookout for that. We may modify the times and the dates and everything just a little bit but this is probably a series that will continue next year as well. So again, we appreciate you jumping on with us this morning and I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and I'll let Dave uh, come up and we'll get started with his presentation. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I appreciate you giving me some time today to, to speak uh, to you good folks out there today. Um, so this is, uh, we're going to be talking today about um, a project that we got funded a couple of years ago from USDA. And I guess it's, uh, I've struggled to think about how it fits in with uh, with ag disruptors. And I guess maybe um, what we're working on now is something um, where a lot of disruption has happened over time in a number of different areas uh, that, that actually serve to displace uh, some crops that used to be grown historically in the region that were really important at the time. Um, and a lot of disruption came in and basically displaced those with other, with other um, options for consumers and for producers to grow. Um, we're talking um, kind of more about heritage crops uh, today. So, um, so let me step back just a little bit and kind of give you a little bit of context for why I think this set of crops that we're working on um, is important. And this is a slide that kind of comes from um, kind of distilling some things that, that I used to present to our new and beginning farmer program, uh, which was primarily smaller farmers, beginning farmers, many of those who were not um, you know, coming from a multiple generation farm, or maybe they had been displaced for a generation or two, but they were coming back to inherited land and that sort of thing. Many of them were coming into a, into a place where uh, they were not necessarily interested or positioned well to compete in a, in a commodity, um, large scale commodity row crop uh, kind of situation. And so they were looking for, for niche products that could, that could serve them well and, and uh, meet a market demand. So so basically, this was our advice to them. You know, they should avoid those commodity crops that need large capital investment um, and that are part of the kind of the, the global economic uh, competition over price for um, a lot of those crops. It's a pretty harsh environment for a small scale farmer to try to operate in. 
Um, instead, they should identify these high value market niches that are not easily replicated by others. Um, and that basically makes them more of a, a product than a commodity, if you will. <clears throat> um, oftentimes, um, they need to be thinking about cooperation with, with other small farmers, you know, maybe even some of those who are located uh, fairly close to them in order to kind of secure some of the benefits of scale economies that might be involved um, either in the production or marketing side. So, you know, things like even sharing equipment, um, sharing knowledge, um, sharing um, access to markets and transportation and logistics and that sort of thing uh, could become part of the picture. And they really probably need to think not so much like traditional farmers, if you will, but more like serial entrepreneurs. That is, they will always be need, need to look for that next competitive advantage in the market. I need to advance this. I just click on here. Maybe there we go. Okay. So what we landed upon um, here, and there's been some people working on some aspects of this for a while. I'll, I'll bring in this, this idea of what we call southern heritage crops, and these are uh, part of a, bro a broader category of, of heirloom crops. Um, those that were um, typically land-raised crops coming from multiple generations of uh, families, uh, farm families, making improvements in a crop uh, over time to try to appeal to you know the market demands that they saw, even for their own consumption um, or for that within typically a fairly localized uh, market, but not always. Some of these were actually quite widespread and and were grown in the South or even in South Carolina, many of them, and found markets as far away as New York City and Boston and that sort of thing, but generally east of the Mississippi for our region. They were really important up until, let's say, about 1960, um, but they basically fell out of favor as people came back from the war with, um, with things like refrigerated um, trucking that could bring produce in from the far stretches uh, west of us, uh, that sort of thing. So um, other other types of crops became more more dominant and kind of supplanted a lot of these. But a lot of more kind of retained in the homestead gardens um, and small plots on some of the small farms still. And in our um, in our group, we have uh, row crops, fruits and vegetables. So there's a number of things out there that we could have started with and we were kind of we needed a starting point um, to start breaking this down into areas you know specific crops that we could work with and uh, so we decided to use the slow food arc of taste for those of you who are unfamiliar with slow food it's an organizational effort that started over in Italy um, a number of decades ago basically in response to fast food and uh, the supplanting of kind of a food culture in Italy that many people were in, were in arms about. So uh, there were actually protests on the streets at the arrival of new McDonald's at that point in time. Uh, slow food is slowly kind of grown across um, beyond um, Italy into Europe, um, made its way into the United States um, probably a good 20 years ago. I remember being involved in some early parts of that and is organized at the national level, but also broken down into um, a number of small um, um, organizations at community, city, and state levels across the country as well, and we're well represented by them in the state. Uh, so they have this project they call the Arc of Taste, and that is where they, um, as they identify crops that they think uh, are worthy of being boarded onto the Arc, think of Noah's Arc, um, the Arc of Taste, then that's where they find their way, and they have a uh, procedure and a process and standards for that they consider for those crops before they're brought there. Um, our own Carolina gold rice, uh, which is here in the state of South Carolina, is part of that mix. Uh, the whole list of other things that you see here in, the, in this uh, slide are also um, on the arc of taste, and they are you know the the group that we are kind of focusing on for the moment. Um, there may be additional things that are kind of discovered and brought on to that arc of taste uh, over time, and we're also, you know, opening to open to, um, I guess, identifying those and kind of helping that process along. So that's been kind of a process for identifying which crops to 
to focus on and the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation, which has been around for um, I think about 17 years now, um, actually um, not only uh, is focused on Carolina Gold Rice, but a number of these other crops as well, they've given uh, support to their redevelopment. And I think it's important to note that um, many of these crops, not all of them, but many of them, including the Carolina Gold Rice, uh, were introduced um, to North America via the slave trade from Africa. And a lot of that comes back to play, I think, later on in our program here. So I kind of broke these down into, into some of the major groupings. So in the vegetable crops, um, you see we have some legumes, some cucurbits, some coal crops, and then some, some other vegetable crops that are, that are out there. And um, these are typically crops that um, they're available to consumers with minimal processing, typically in these um, direct consumer facing markets. So in your farmer's markets, maybe in a community supported agriculture or CSA, operation, maybe a farm stand, um, and also um, into to consumers through restaurants and that sort of thing. Chefs um, really enjoy these sorts of things. Another area are grains. Um, you know, these typically um, involve more processing or steps in the process to make them consumer ready. Um, and we um, have within that uh, some some corn or maize crops you'll see several listed there that that have been identified and kind of reintroduced um, we have some small grains um, and of course we have uh, the rice crop there too then some tree crops uh, that are on that list um, there's some nuts and some fruits here uh, and again there could be uh, more that are introduced later on but these are specific crops that have been uh, boarded onto the Slow Food Arc of Taste and are part of the subject of our, of our inquiry with this project. There's even what under, under other crops there was the, uh, the indigo uh, crop. So um, some of the considerations, some of the reasons for doing this is that, and focusing on these Southern heritage, heritage crops is like I said before is uh, small farmers need to find something that's not easily replicated uh, by others. So we need some some possible barriers to entry there that are basically not not capital intensive. Um, you know, barriers to entry for those farmers um, with respect to the, the large scale commodity row crops are, you know, a lot of equipment and land requirements. Um, these crops have other barriers to entry potentially, so that people from outside the region or without the know-how and, and uh, knowledge to grow them effectively, uh, will find it more difficult to participate. So it, it, it provides a potential opportunity for people to secure a niche and for that niche to, to last a little longer than it otherwise would before someone else can grow it. Uh, and the European system, um, there are more kind of legal supports to help uh, people with, once they've named something that is specific to their, to their region, that is tied to their culture and their place, they can protect it. In the US, it's a lot more difficult to do that, except for, say, in the, in the winery um, uh, sector with uh, grapevines. Um, <clears throat> so parallel to that, there has been this resurgence and in interest in, in the culinary um, area. You know, you can find these crops uh, showing up um, on the plates of high-end restaurants and so um, there's there's market opportunity that we sense there for these for many of them uh, since they are local we don't need to worry so much about long distance logistics and also um, because of modern advancements in in crop breeding um, we can actually do more about breeding in to our crops things that emphasize flavor and nutrition while de-emphasizing some of the potential um, issues with respect to disease resistance and that sort of thing. So our project, um, we have an excellent team here at Clemson, uh, primarily with, with some, con some important contributions may being made from um, the University of South Carolina on this. So we're working across those boundaries with our project. Um, it's building on this previous and ongoing work for, from the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation, connects to the Slow Food Arc of Taste, um, 
and we are integrating a more formal element of market intelligence into this project than was previously there. So we're, besides breeding these crops, uh, making them available to producers, we want to begin to, in a more formalized sense, understand what the market will bear and what the potentials are there. Um, when we get to the outreach with our um, with our producers, um, we'll be working with uh, South Carolina State and um, and Clemson 1862 and 1890 extension and beyond uh, our own state too. We anticipate uh, approaching that as a southeastern region kind of approach. So I've listed um, several names here, people who were on the original team when we wrote the grant proposal a few years ago. Um, within this group, we have um, a lot of people that hopefully uh, you know, uh, maybe some new people that you'll meet along the way, but we have economists um, to help with the marketing and the market intelligence side. We have crop breeders uh, in here, people that know a whole lot about um, actually growing uh, these crops and bringing the best science available to the task of, of growing them. Uh, we've actually had some, some newer uh, folks uh, get involved with this and um, and so Kevin, uh, who you know here from the day, is is uh, now working with some of the crop enterprise budgets for, for especially crops in the state, and he's going to come in and help us with that part. Um, there's a colleague from, from NC State that I discovered here in the last year who is going to come in and work with us on some of the demand analysis. Um, and we have a, a new hire in vegetable breeding and genetics and assistant professor, Jenna Hirschberger. I'm also bringing in... Um, a consulting company here in the state, Madsen Consulting, who's helping us with some aspects of the project. So our goals for this project are to assess the feasibility for, long, for a profitable production of these crops by small and medium farmers uh, in the state and potentially across the South. We want to understand kind of what the existing conditions are. Um, we need to think about what is the in the infrastructure that's necessary uh, beyond just growing these crops and understanding the markets, you know, what is it we need to have in place to that would help enable and facilitate uh, these small scale producers to get that crop uh, to market um, and that sort of thing. Um, so we will be looking at, at market feasibility. Uh, we want to develop some marketing best practices, production best practices. And, and integrate that into a training curriculum that we'll offer about two to three years from now when we're ready to do that. Uh, we may do some smaller portions of that um, before then. Uh, we want to work on a branding and marketing strategic plan for Southern Heritage Crops, something that will help the consumer to understand kind of the story that's behind them um, in the marketplace. And we want to take a look in our assessment of not just the hard infrastructure in terms of, say, processing facilities and that sort of thing, but also what do we need in terms of organizational infrastructure uh, to help support this. And uh, Kevin and I are sitting here today actually at a, at a co-op development uh, center workshop that's looking at co-op development um, uh, in the state. And there's great promise, we think, in something that might be like a co-op or or um, a similar type organization to help support uh, some of this work. And then ultimately, once we better understand the marketplace and kind of what the requirements are to bring this to market, you know, we do have our plant breeders there in place and we do have infrastructure in the state to deal with uh, advanced plant breeding, but they need clear targets on what their priorities ought to be. So the, the, the hope is that in this project, we can get a clearer sense of targets for them um, with their activities as well. And we can identify who the seed producers uh, will be for these crops within the state. And these are just some of the, the uh, kind of day-to-day uh, -day activities that we'll be involved in um, to carry this out. So in the process, um, you know, once we wrote this grant proposal and came back and we started working um, on this together, one of the things that we turned up was, um, and this kind of goes to the plant breeding uh, world. This is something that's brought to me by Stephen Kresovich, who does a lot of work um, in the developing world in Africa and South America. Uh, this is from a group of, of plant breeders in, in Africa, primarily in Africa, 
who, um, you know, they have all these, these great tools at their um, disposal now to do advanced plant breeding, uh, to identify specific genes and that sort of thing that they can emphasize in their plant breeding. But without the guidance of uh, social scientists and economists and others who um, understand the market, uh, they don't know, where, again, where to place their emphasis. And so they've started this new, um, this new project, their orientation, that's much more about let's, let's engage with the marketplace, understand where those priorities need to be, and let's focus our breeding programs around where the most market potential is. Now, the thinking on that market development side has been, you know, not very advanced uh, yet in terms of what we've found. And so what we've decided to do is introduce some frameworks there that we think will be beneficial. And the one that we're, we're using right now is um, using Porter's competitive forces model, which looks at a number of, of factors uh, in the market that we think are important to help us discover kind of where, you know, where, um, how strong is this market? How robust is the market for any of these specific crops? So the idea of industry rivalry, uh, how many producers are there? If you only have a few producers, then you can kind of own the market um, if it's an important uh, market. Um, if you can erect barriers to entry, um, or if it's naturally there within the product, like we mentioned before, um, because it's from the region and there's something unique about it that can that can only really be delivered by, through production in this region, then we can we can kind of exclude some people from the outside who might have an interest uh, in growing for that market. Um, the threat of substitutes, you know, if there's other things that are, yeah, they're they're just about as good, but they're lower priced. Then of course we want to um, avoid those situations or emphasize the true benefits of the crops that we're working on as much as possible. Uh, the bargaining power of customers. You know, there's a lot of people out there who have demand for the product or a lot of potential markets for it. That's better for the producer. If there's only a couple of, um, or a small amount of, of customers, then uh, those customers have, have power in the marketplace and they can basically demand um, that they pay lower prices from the producers. So we wanna know what's going on there. And then the bargaining power suppliers. So let's say if we're in a situation where there's really high demand for a particular crop, but the seed supply is really constrained, um, then, um, then that seed supplier has a lot of power in that situation as well. And so we want to understand those dynamics as well as we take a look at um, doing our market uh, assessment or a potential assessment for this project. So I was working with a, a postdoc on this project and we said, let's, um, let's take a look uh, at that and see what it looks like for, um, for these products. And so far, this is kind of the, the crazy diagram that we've, we've come up with that factors a lot of these things in in a more visual way. And uh, we won't take the time to go through this in great detail today, but um, uh, we, will, we plan to probably use this as we do our assessment, but then also as we do our outreach. But as you can see, there's a lot of factors to be taken into account uh, as we think about introducing in a more robust way any, any one of these particular products uh, into the marketplace. Many of these are already being grown. Um, I think we're talking about um, you know, scaling um, and, and making the possibility open to additional producers. And so these, these uh, considerations will really come into play then. So we've been doing some interviews, uh, going out and making site visits and talking to the people who are involved in this. We, we were gonna start um, with restaurants and interviewing them and maybe doing some surveying and that sort of thing. But with COVID, we had to kind of put that on the back burner and bring um, grains to the fore for now. And so we've been talking with microbreweries and craft distilleries and millers um, and, and others that are involved um, as stakeholders in the supply chain. And we think we've already kind of got some, at least some preliminary results here that we can begin to, to grapple with. Um, it seems like in all these sectors, and there's, there's plenty of anecdotal evidence right now that there's 
there is strong demand for these special crops in these kind of more boutique sectors, if you will, uh, the ones that are supplying into microbreweries, craft distilleries, um, you know, they, they're quite different than the large scale brewers or the large scale distillers. They're creating a product that is that typically uh, demands a higher price already. But if they can introduce, you know, one more element of value added into their product, like a, a heritage grain that has a local interesting story that is, um, you know, a part of um, part of the mix, then they can, um, you know, they can see a higher price in the market for their product. Um, the same with millers, um, you know, the large scale flour mills. Now they may not be necessarily so interested, but those ones that have um, basically secured a niche with with home bakers, with artisan um, bakeries, um, and that sort of thing. Uh, they definitely have a place in this and millers are not just flour millers that's also those that are producing grits and cornmeal and polenta and um and heritage grain products directly um and even even rice uh, like the carolina gold rice and uh, fits within that mix as well so um one thing we do see here is that typically with grains there's a higher initial capital investment you're talking about more land um intensive uh kind of kind of crops um with equipment needs you know harvesting machinery village machinery that sort of thing that is um involved but we're also finding because this is kind of a new thing um for our state is that our supply chains are pretty piecemeal and fragile and really depend upon one-on-one -on -one personal relationships between uh, the, the various components uh, within that supply chain. So we really think there's some there's some real potential um, in helping to create a more robust supply chain for for small heritage grains in the state. And we'll talk about that maybe a little bit more later. Um, one of the other groups we've we've spoken with were food hubs. You know, they basically are positioned to reach restaurants and retail grocery um, in this state. And there's definitely um, they're definitely interested in, and they also work with producers uh, who supply to them. There's interest in knowing, okay, well, which crops should we encourage them to plant um, in this next growing season? And, um, you know, we haven't done all of our research yet, so it's a little bit premature there. So the advice we've given to them is, why don't you start experimenting and just kind of see what's going on and keep better track of uh, if you're already handling some of these products, um, how they're doing in the market place, uh, you know, as you talk to the grocery store and, and uh, restaurant um, folks um, to see kind of what's, you know, is there a demand for these, these sorts of products at that level, but then also with the producers, kind of what's their experience in growing and selling these products. Um, so uh, we also, the, uh, another lesson, I guess, in this, and it's good, it's just common sense really, is that the, the vegetable and fruit crops are really most well suited for more direct markets. Um, one of the reasons that a lot of these heritage crops aren't being grown at a large scale in the region um, or why they are supplanted by other crops that are produced at larger scale is because they weren't necessarily always well suited to the long supply chain situation. Uh, they're maybe more fragile, um, probably in most cases tastier, maybe more nutritious, but they're more fragile and, and they're more delicate to handle. And so shorter supply chains um, is probably the likely um, most important market for those, those types of crops. And the other thing that's important that we've kind of um, connected with here is that these heritage crops, given that they're tied to the region, they're unique and special. They have a story that connects with the history and the culture of the region is that they could become, and I think in many cases they already are, really important assets for agritourism development in the state. So that as people come and visit agritourism oriented sites or producers that are willing to, to be open to the public, there's some opportunities uh, there in at least three different areas. Um, one is people have an interest in just seeing how these things are grown or how they're processed. Um, how many people have actually set foot on a on a rice plantation 
or seen how milling occurs of that product. Um, of course, there's the on-farm purchases of these products. Uh, people really like to bring some of those things home with them, but also there's an opportunity, say, on-site to prepare meals and that sort of thing to kind of enhance the agritourism experience. And then to um, kind of sustain that experience even longer and connect with that uh, with those consumers once they have gone home to wherever they live, whether that's in state or well beyond the state, um, with with an e-commerce strategy, many of these products can be shipped, um, especially if they're shelf stable products, and that just helps to extend the agritourism experience of these consumers, while also selling more of that product that's being produced on on those farms. And with more product being sold, uh, going back to the basics of supply and demand, um, that's increasing demand and that should have an effect, an effect potentially on increasing prices uh, for the products over time. So um, what's on the front burner um, in our project? Uh, just to let you know here, we did not within our grant scope say that we were going to um, do a consumer study. We decided to anyway. And so right now we're getting geared up. We'll probably do this in about three months from now, I think is my best get, guess, uh, to do a willingness to pay study of US and Canadian consumers for these products, um, to take, a, take stock of their willingness to pay uh, for product um, like physical attributes, like what's the taste, uh, nutrition, those sorts of things, um, to take stock of production methods. Are they interested in organic versus conventional, for example? Are they interested in the cultural historical significance of these crops and the story that they, they carry with them? And also, um, is there an interest in, uh, in the consumer side to pay uh, something extra for uh, producer demographics. So are these coming from smaller farmers? <clears throat> are they coming from minority farmers? Do they have a strong connection, like I mentioned before, many of them to the uh, to the African diaspora and, and the folks who are um, directly involved there? So we'll continue to do some interviews and possible willing to pay study with chefs and restaurants. Uh, that's the one we delayed because of COVID. Um, we're getting geared up to do some work with um, the brewery and distillery guilds here in South Carolina uh, to understand their willingness to pay for these crops a little more. <clears throat> um, and we'll continue with uh, the same sort of thing with Miller's. And then um, one of the things we'd like to do, and this will involve us being in touch uh, with um, stakeholders in this uh, heritage grains value chain, to see if we can't do some strategic planning there to create a more robust uh, situation with respect to, uh, to that situation. And there's my name and my email address. If you have an interest in this topic at all, you want to carry on a conversation um, or learn more, um, please just send me an email. Uh, we are working on a, a website right now. It's not quite ready for prime time. Uh, we're going to start uh, putting information uh, out of the public a little more from this project. Um, but for now, I think the best way for you to be in touch with me is just to directly send me an email. Kevin, I think that's all I have uh, for now. I don't know if we take any questions or anything like that, or Are there any that came through. I need to stop sharing probably to see, don't I? No, I can. No, there's no questions out there in chat. Um, I can share a link and a couple of things okay. before we end. So. Okay. I'm going to say, yeah, we'll get All right. We, uh, we do want to thank Dave for being on with us and for sharing a little bit about that project and some of those crops and some of those areas are a little bit more niche and maybe smaller areas right now. But as you can hear and tell, it's kind of a more of a large scale project potentially that would be going on. So as Dave said, if you've got more interest in this area, uh, please reach out to him and, and you'll probably start to see more as far as a website and things like that as well. So I'm going to, Zach sent a little information about their Farming Foundations course, and I want to share that with you before we end today. As I said, Zach had something come up today and was not able to join us. We hope to have him on a later program. But uh, basically, the Farming Foundations class 
is a online curriculum that they've developed for kind of new and beginning uh, producers or someone that might have interest in starting. Uh, and it goes through some real basics, just basic knowledge level. It has, I think, 14 modules that a, pr a p producer or a potential producer can go through uh, to learn some of the basics. And then they kind of encourage you to take that and start to have com more conversations with your extension agent and other specialists and um, people within your network in the state. So I'm going to share that in the chat right now. They have just a little YouTube about it. So if you click on that link, or if you search Farming Foundations Clemson, it should bring up more information about that. Um, and you know what? We got a notice that chat, I think, was disabled right now for participants. So, so yeah, thank you for letting us know that. So I did put the link in the chat. If you've got comments or questions in the, the next minute or so, feel free to submit those. I apologize that that setting was disabled. I see Q&A is working and it looks like the webinar chat uh, should now be available to you all as well. But again, um, feel free to reach out to us anytime, whether it's this afternoon's webinar or sometime later down the road, you may think of another question related to some of these topics that you'd like to know about. And like I said, if you've got other speakers or other topics that you'd like to hear more about, you can submit that to us and we'll uh, we'll work on getting that on the schedule as well. We have the one more webinar, which will be December 21st, Employee Retention and Management with Steve Isaacs of Kentucky. We may add another short topic that month. And then all of our past webinars are also uploaded to our Clemson Agribusiness YouTube channel. So if you'd like to go back and review anything or learn about some of the topics you might have missed, then you can catch them that way as well. But I believe that's it for today. We do appreciate you logging in and joining us. We appreciate Dave's time and uh, we will adjourn for today and we hope to see you next month as well.